everybody. Welcome. Just after 7.30, so I guess we'll go ahead and start. I want to welcome you to the Lopez Island Historical Society's 2022 Speaker Series. This is our second to the last um, speaker for the year. The last one is on November 19th. It'll be about um, the rocky intertidal zones and how they're changing with global warming, so that, or global change, climate change, that's the word. So it should be interesting. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, and as always, we want to acknowledge that we are living on the homelands of the Coast Salish people, specifically here, some of the straight Salish speakers who are the Samish and the Lummi, the Songish and the Wasanish, and many other tribes that have ties to the islands, like the Swinomish, the Stillaguamish, the Skagit, and probably quite a few that I'm not remembering because I didn't bring my notes. Um, but we're grateful to be living here and to be, what I want to say, um, stewarding their land. And it's always good to keep that in mind. Um, tonight, we have a very special speaker. Julie Stein from the Burke Museum. Dr. Julie Stein has recently retired as the director. And when I started grad school in 2004, I think she had just become the director. Is that about right? Yeah. Um, and I got to work in the archaeology department when I was in grad school there, which was a pretty special experience. And so I got to know Julie a little bit then. And so Julie retired in 2022, so just earlier this year, as the executive director of the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture, a position she held since 2005. She led a 10-year campaign that resulted in a new facility, which opened in October 2019. This building reveals Burke research and collections in a rapidly transparent and accessible way and connects visitors to staff and volunteers who use them. This process is called Turning the Museum Inside Out and establishes the work as a new kind of museum. Previously, she served as the museum's curator of archaeology and as professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Washington and was divisional dean of research, computing, and facilities for the College of Arts and Sciences. Stein received her MA and PhD degrees from the University of Minnesota and her BA degree from Western Michigan University. Her research interests are in geoarchaeology, especially studies involving Northwest Coast shamans. She is now Emeritus Director of the Burke Museum and Emeritus Professor of Anthropology at the University of Washington. So let's welcome Julie. One thing I learned about myself in all the years of teaching is that I have to be able to move or I can't speak. So I hope you can uh, see me. I probably won't go too far, but I need to move. Uh, today I want to talk about archaeology of the San Juan Islands of the Northwest Coast, but I want to do it in a new way. I want to tell you how archaeologists used to do archaeology and how we now do it differently because of the close and respectful relationships that we have with Native Americans in the region. We are excavating, for the most part, their ancestors. And if you think about it, they know what their ancestors did. Yet for many, many years, we were telling them what we learned that their ancestors did. So in order to understand how radical the difference is, I'm going to give you a little mini lesson on how archaeologists really do archaeology. This is an experiment. I've never given this talk before. So if you all fall asleep, I'm going to know it was a total failure. <laughs> but I don't think you will. So I'm going to start by saying that this is my, the thing I, my biggest problem at the Burke Museum 
was people don't know the difference between paleontology and archaeology. So I'm going to give you a little lesson, because I paleontologists study animals that walk on the landscape. So I'm a dinosaur, okay? And I walk on the landscape and I follow her dead and I'm buried. Archaeologists study people who walk along the landscape and they drop stuff that they made and then that stuff gets buried. Animals follow her dead, people drop stuff. We both dig things up from the ground, so I know why you're confused, but how, what am I? Archaeologist. Yes. <laughs> I am not a paleontologist. Okay, that was number one. So far you're awake. <laughs> um, the second thing is that archaeologists start their studies by looking at the landscape. And this is a picture that I took, and I'm not a good photographer, walking along the bluff above the Cattle Point Road on San Juan Island. And these four deer came like running at me. I was kind of like, can they hurt me? <laughs> um, but I took, this is my favorite picture I've ever taken outside of my grandchildren. So. We look at this landscape and we say, it looks like this now, but what did it look like 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago? What's the role of erosion? What happened to the trees? What happened to the plants? Forget the people. Where was the water? How high was the water? Where was the shoreline? And then the second thing we ask about the landscape is it an erosional landscape or a depositional landscape. Now, an erosional landscape is one where if you built your house or dropped your artifacts on the ground, and in 200 years, it would roll down the hill and there would be no record of where you dropped it because it eroded down the hill. If you drop your artifacts in a depositional landscape, that's one where when you drop it, other sediment and dirt comes in and buries it. You must realize that in all of this land of the San Juans, People have been walking along the landscape probably every single square foot. They've been here for approximately 16,000 years. And they've been dropping things everywhere. But we would never find the places where they drop things on an erosional landscape. Right? So archaeologists are looking for how did the landscape change? And where are the depositional landscapes so that we have a chance of finding something? Okay, I think. So here is English camp. And that's uh, looking back at the, um, I think that's the barracks there in the background. So we're around the bay. And you get an idea here that these trees are probably not very old. And these are all my students, and they're back in the trees, back over there. And I'm trying to get the perspective that it's actually quite hilly there. And that the hilliness is probably artificially manufactured depositional environment and the trees have been cut down, where was the shoreline, how much of it changed. The next one is also English camp. I excavated there with students from 1983 to 1991. So if any of you were ever over at San Juan Island, and I have people say this all the time, hey, I was over there and there was an excavation and it was the University of Washington, and it was really cool. Do you know anything about that? Oh, yeah, that was me. <laughs> oh, that was me. So the thing I want you to look at 
this is archaeologists always want to know what's on the bottom. Because what's on the bottom is the oldest. It was put there first. The best example I tell my students, it's like your laundry basket or your recycling bin. If you're looking for something that you wore a long time ago, you look at the bottom of the laundry basket. If you look at your a recycle bin and you want to know something that was a month ago, you look at the bottom. So it's hard to see the layers here. But we always talk about archaeology with the bottom on the bottom and the surface on the surface. So I will be showing you tables and talking about dates. The oldest is always on the bottom and the youngest is always on the top. Another question I get asked a lot is why do you dig in squares? Is that a house and you knew where the walls were and that's why it's square? No, that is not where the house was. That is not, I don't know where the house was. We dig in squares because of geometry. It's easier to reconstruct an A, B, and C uh, vector to know exactly where the thing you found was located, because you have to reconstruct it when you get back in the lab. So digging in a circle is really hard. You guys are shaking your heads. This is good. Things are going well so far. Okay, the next one. Okay, now we're getting into the really heavy stuff. Archaeologists use primarily a concept that was developed by Franz Boas. Uh, he came up in the 18, late 1800s with a normative concept of culture, which is essentially generalized patterns of behavior. I had to put those words down there because you would have, your brains would have exploded if I said that. A normative concept of culture is thinking your mind, what did you wear in the 60s? Okay, got it? How about the 80s? How many of you had really bad perms in the 80s? <laughs> okay, the fact that we can talk about a decade and you can have an, an understanding is because there was a normative concept of culture that if you look at what you are all wearing, I actually said, ooh, what should I wear? I'm going to Lopez. <laughs> Okay, they're probably going to wear jeans. We're looking at a lot of jeans, a lot of puffy coats, a lot of, you know, there is a normative concept of Lopesian culture in this room. The next slide, I stole this over the internet, but these are four different decades of cars. So, you can, we do this all the time. It's a very um, common practice to group types of objects in time intervals. And so Boaz wasn't you know, crazy, but he said, let's apply this to archaeology. So, okay, here we go. First of all, we have to describe a type. Now, I went with perms and um, jeans. But it is a describe a type. Um, it's one item, could be a point, could be hair, it could be your pants, could be cars. But a component is when you have many items found together. And in archaeology, you could have a certain kind of point with a certain style of moth. And they're always found together. I said jeans and sweatshirts, um, but I think for the 80s we could do perms and shoulder pads and I can't go any further, but um, it was what? Leg warmers. Oh, leg warmers. I forgot about leg warmers. 
Um, so we have certain types, and we have groups of types, which are called components. And then we have time periods when the types and the components were similar. So I, we, I was referring to decades, but archaeologists call them phases, or periods, or traditions. The Roman period in Roman archaeology. So the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. Um, so the first thing archaeologists do when they come into a region is they create a culture history of an area by using types, components, and putting them into phases and periods with the oldest on the bottom and the youngest on the top. You got it? It made sense. OK. You are so much smarter than the students at the University of Washington. <laughs> so for an example, um, in the Northwest Coast, when we wanted to make a culture history, we had to start from scratch, because we are not Native Americans, and we are creating the culture history of somebody else's culture. So we looked at the culture they had at contact. And we know that they used, um, they had a lot of fishing, hunting, trapping, gathering, and a technology that included woodworking and fiber and weaving and stone. So this is Hillary Stewart's um, drawing, wonderful drawing, of uh, cedar slabs using wedges and mauls. Now, what you see in these two individuals using are the mall that is depicted, man, this is where I have my laser pointer. I love this thing. OK, so they are using this mall on this part right here, and he's got one here. And so what archaeologists would do is say, they did this at contact. I find this kind of type of mall. I'm assuming they did the same thing in the past, but the malls look different in the past than they did at contact. This is a nipple top mall. This is a flat top mall. And those are critical types of malls that were used in culture histories. So the example with points is 9,000 years ago, people used predominantly leaf-shaped points. Now, archaeologists are not botanists. There's a million different kinds of leaves. What are you talking about? What a leaf? Well, it's a willow tree leaf not an oak leaf or a maple leaf. So it has a point on the top and a point on the bottom. And through time, we get more stemmed points. Now, we call them points because every one of them has a pointy end. And archaeologists, unlike the National Park Service, puts the pointy end pointing up. The National Park Service has it wrong, just so you know. They put their point facing down. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. So our points are all pointed in the upward direction. And the thing on the other end of the point is actually a stylistic variation. You can have one that has a stem, which is, um, you know, uh, here's a there's a stem right there, or there's a stem, or you can have triangles. Here's the triangles. Now, archaeologists have put them into this order because they found these on the bottom, these in the middle, and these at the top. And here in the San Juans, the raw material that people use is pre predominantly this black, fine-grained, 
uh, volcanic rock that's called either dacite or andesite, but most of us call it dacite. Um, okay, I think that is all I wanted to say there. Thank you. Next slide. We, for example, we put this culture history together in uh, the earliest person to do this was Arden King in his excavations from 1946 to 1949 at um, what is now American Camp, but the site is called Cattle Point Site. Very confusing, I know. But he excavated right after the war, took a group of students from the University of Washington and excavated on the bluff at American Camp. And I wanted to just explain this number here. This is a way that archaeologists developed to give unique numbers to archaeological sites throughout the United States. And the Smithsonian put this series together for the 48 contiguous states within the United States. They lined them up alphabetically and gave them 1 through 48. Very tricky, don't you think? Washington is site is state number 45. Every county in the state of Washington is given an official abbreviation. SJ, San Juan. Now you may say, well, this isn't hard, but Washington has an unfortunate number of counties that start with K and I. Kittitas, Klickitat, King County, uh, Kitsap. So somebody has to be in charge of giving the right initials to the right county. So that is the job of the State Office of Archaeology. Then we record the very first site that was ever recorded in that county, and that is site number one. There it is, 45 SJ number one. In 1946, Arden King was excavating and recorded the first site in San Juan County. We're now up to a thousand. There's thousands of officially recorded archaeological sites in San Juan County. The next one. Um, King put together a chronology. And remember now, we're looking for normative patterns of behavior, and we're putting them into types and components, and arranging them by time periods. So he used the term phase, and he had some very tricky words. There was the island phase that became the development, the maritime, and the late. In the island phase, there was the absence of shell, which he interpreted to mean that they were not collecting shellfish in the marine intertidal area. Instead, they were hunting deer, elk, small mammals, and they were using leaf-shaped points. This time period, according to King, went to the developmental period where you have, for the first time, the appearance of shell. So now, they are collecting shellfish from the intertidal zone. They now have fish and birds and deer and elk and small mammals, but there's the introduction of bone tools as well as stemmed points. In the maritime, you now still have shell, but you have a lot of bone points, different kinds, a lot of stone points, and the triangle points up here, as well as stemmed points, not so many leaf-shaped points. And then the late one is lots of shell, but not very many artifacts, fewer artifacts, um, as measured by volume of shell. So this is what he came up with. He didn't know the absolute age of these because he didn't have any way to anchor it in time. 
Radiocarbon dating was not invented until the 1950s. So, the next slide. The next thing we do is we look for lots more sites and we start radiocarbon dating them. I'm going to explain this more a little later. This up here is SJIAV, San Juan Island Archaeological Project. Everything that I did in the San Juan Islands was part of the San Juan Island Ar Archaeological Project. There are, at the Bird Museum, chairs that have SJIP on them, cupboards with SJIAP. If I bought it, I put SJIAP on it. So um, that means that it was something I did. This one over here is a non-SJIAP project or date. So this just gives you an idea of how many depositional landscapes where we took something that could be dated and submitted it for radiocarbon dates. This isn't a map of all of the sites in the San Juans um, or all the ones that were excavated. This is just radiocarbon dates. And based on that, we now have a more precise chronology. Notice that the oldest we think that people were here is about 16,000 years ago. And that's the close in Paleo-Indian period. This is when the Ice Age plants, animals, and fluted points. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. From 9,000 to 4,500 years ago, we have an early period. It has a culture type of Old Cordilleran and phase called the Cascade. Now you see why these words, they mean something to me because they are talking about components. And a period is talking about time. And some of them are talking about stratigraphy or the layers. But to you, it doesn't really matter, right? It's a group of normative culture behavior that had elk, deer, oak savannas, leaf-shaped points with a middle period, phases called Marco, Lacarno Beach, and St. Mungo, or Maine, where the maritime resources are used, the shell middens appear, and the triangular and stem points. And then the last one is a late period where there's maritime shell midden and only triangular points. Now, look at this time over here. This is really, I think, very telling for how archaeologists put together these. It's arbitrarily this one is, is 1,500 years of duration, but all the rest are 1,000, one more thousand, one more thousand, 45 more hundred, and then a whole big jump. Do you think that these Marple, Carnegie Beach, St. Mungo are exactly 1,000 years old? And you know, on January 1 of 1,000 something, they said, Okay, throw those stem points out. We're only using triangle ones. <laughs> no. In fact, until we did the SJIAP, there was a handful of radiocarbon dates on which this whole thing was based. So it is a lumping together of general sorts to talk about change through time. Now, let me just give you a little update on Clovis, because everybody loves Clovis. The next one. Um, the Clovis period is known by, from points that have a flute. Okay, here's the flute. So a point has a point, pointing in the right direction, and on the base, there is a flat surface and a Clovis point or a fluted point 
The last thing the maker did was hit this thing that was removed here. It has a little lumpy thing on it. And you hit it with your hammer. And if you're very skilled, you hit it just right. And this flute comes flying off. Or else the whole thing breaks and you start over again. It is a kind of uh, artifact, a type, that is so diagnostic. You show me a fluted point and I'll say, it is between 16,000 and 9,000 years ago. That's fluted points. They're only named for, actually, it only goes to about 12,000 years ago. 16,000 and 12,000 years ago. Not one fluted point has ever been found in the San Juan Island as far as I know. And I've seen a lot of your points. I've really seen a <laughs> lot of your points. Now, there's one on Whidbey, was found near Evie's Landing. There's one at Swim, over on the Olympic Peninsula. And there's others um, on the mainland. We know that Clovis hunters were here. And we know that Ice Age animals were here because of the Ice Age animals that have been found on Orcus, the bison and others. There's even some suggestion that the bison that was found in the wetlands of Orcus Island had cut marks on it where a really um, strong tendon on a uh, remember what bone it was. Anyway, a really strong tendon was cut with a sharp thing, leaving grooves in the bone that could only be made by stone tools. But we didn't find any stone tools because we didn't excavate those bison because they were pulled up out of the wetland by a backhoe building us something or other without a permit. So we don't have any information. And nobody, you know, we can't go through all the back dirt to find if there was a close point needle in the haystack. So I think that they were here. It's just, think about the landscape. The ice was melting of a, of a continental glacier. The land was unstable. It had frozen, it had sediment everywhere calving uh, icebergs, um, perched lakes. People could walk on it, people could hunt on it, people could maybe have boats and could navigate through it. But if you dropped anything, it's not a depositional landscape. It is an erosional landscape of unbelievable proportions. It's all going out into the Straits of Juan de Fuca. Okay. Next one. Okay, so back to the culture history. I've now simplified it and had just the phase names, Cascade, St. Mungo, Maine, Locarno Beach, Marco, San Juan, with my little dates. I lumped a couple of them together. Now, the thing I wanted to show here is that there's more than just those few characteristics or types one of them is um, Markhol has nipple top malls and San Juan face has flat top malls. For some reason or other, they stopped making nipple top malls. And in the most recent excavations of the most recent occupations, they went switched to flat tops. Um, the triangle points are more frequent in the more recent sites. And the stem points are most frequent in the Cascade. Uh, bone tools are most frequently found in these three, the two phases here, Carnot Beach and St. Mungo, with marble, but by San Juan, they kind of aren't, you don't find as many of them. So if you show me a bone tool, I think, uh, it's probably between 1,500 and maybe 3,500 years ago. 
that's not necessarily true. I mean, it could be 1,500. There were a few of them. It's just they weren't found as many of them. These um, objects here, which you have some excellent examples in the museum, we don't know exactly what they were used for. They have perforations in them, so we say, well, they were probably sewn on to clothing and their decorations. These could be ear spools. This is a labret. You know, you make a hole in your lip and you put the flat side on the inside against your teeth, and then the pointy thing sticks out through your lip, through your lip here. Now, in the 80s and 90s, when I would teach these undergraduates about the breaths, they'd say, oh my gosh. Well, have you been to the University of Washington? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody has these things now. So, um, so what I'm trying to get you to understand is that it's a bit of a non-precise uh, exercise of assigning a type and a component to a face. And unless you find the object in the layer next to the thing that you can radiocarbon date, you don't really know how old it is. And that's why archaeologists get nuts when you pull it out and you bring it to me and say, well, how old is it? <laughs> I could have told you. If you wouldn't have ripped it out of the context of the component and the face. So I don't mean to say we're all crazy, but it, we do kind of get a little heated uh, by these mentions. So here we get to the interesting thing. We build a culture history, and until 1960, that's all archaeologists in the United States were trying to do, is just build culture histories for every place. Um, in middle America, in Mexico, Guatemala, in the East Coast, Central Coast, I mean center of the, of the uh, country, West Coast, everybody was scrambling just to build culture histories. But in the 60s, after the 60s, People started saying, well, that's okay, but why did it change? Why did it go from nipple top malls to flat top malls? So when you ask why questions, there's usually two categories of answers or explanations. The first one is culture ecology or environmental change. Something happened that cause people to change. Now, here in the San Juans, uh, you may have heard that the western red cedars were not here until about 4,500, maybe 6,000 years ago. The ice came, and it was continental glaciers. It was totally the wrong environment for the western red cedar. They were here before, but they died. They were, you know, ground up by the glaciers. Now, it was a continental glacier in a, a, um, a latitude that was warmer than the Arctic. But still, western red cedars spent the whole ice age in the southern and middle part of Oregon. There weren't any of them here. Now, the ice melts. They can't just pop up out of the ground. There's no seeds. They're gone. So what had to happen was that the refugia in Oregon had these trees that had cones falling to the south and to the north. Well, the ones that fell to the north, there was the western red cedar, and then a western red cedar. And it took until 6,000 years ago for them to get all the way back up here. So, our ethnographic analogy of what people were like in the K-12 
cascade phase is crazy. There's no cedar. They can't make cedar. They can't make the weaving, the planks. They don't need malls. In fact, the kind of forest that was here was an oak savanna, wide open. And there are estimates that there were more elk and deer than even on Lopez Island. <laughs> <laughs> that this was perfect habitat for elk and, for elk and deer. They ate the acorns from the oaks, and that anybody living in this whole region were hunters. And you could see really far, because <clears throat> you didn't have these big old growth forests. It was a very different time. That is an explanation for why the cascade phase changed into those island phase or development phase or the St. Mungo, uh, Carnot Beach, Marco phases. Another example is sea level change. What if everybody was collecting maritime resources, shellfish? But they were doing it when the sea level was five meters lower than it is today, which is it was at the end of the ice age, because the ice was really heavy and it pushed down the land. I'm not going to be able to do this, but it pushed down the land, and worldwide sea level went down, and then just like a cork that was. You push down a cork in water, and you take your finger away, it pops way up, and then goes mm, mm, mm. So the ice melts, the land went mm, 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 mm. Where was the shoreline? And that's those notches on the cattle point and the cattle point road and where those four deer were. Those are shorelines from post-glacial still stands of the shore when the land was depressed and it came up and then went down and now it's here and there. Well, what if all of the sites, depositional landscapes, that had evidence of maritime resources are now way up there? They're underwater. They're gone. They're eroded. That could be an explanation. The second category of answer to why did it change, our favorite, is population increase due to innovations. And here in the Northwest, the best one is reef netting and bird nets and potlatch. So what if you were collecting all of your fish, your salmon, which is very important in this culture, by waiting until they get to the rivers. Now, you know that salmon go out in the ocean and they get really fat, really chunk up, and then they stop eating and they make it all the way back up to spawn. So if you wait till they get to the river, they've used up more and more and more fat until they you know, are, have no fat at all at the end. So you're eating fish that has less fat. If you invent reef netting, you now can go out into the open ocean, San Juan's is a perfect place to do it, and collect fish that have so much more fat because they're hundreds, hundreds of miles before they get out the Fraser River. Hundreds, yes. Yeah. Because some of them go way up the Fraser River. So um, the explanations for why one thing changes to another, to another, to another, are always questions about why did it happen. And our favorite art explanations are culture ecology and evolution, cultural evolution. We invented something. So the next. So here is an example of an archaeologist, me, that came up looking, searching for an explanation of why something changed. 
I got radiocarbon dates from all of these places. And, you know, I apologize that Lopez, we didn't have that many. But um, there's some from Mud Bay, and there's some from Watmau, and um, uh, this is where we are right here, right? The Fisherman's uh, Bay, and a few from the north. Um, this is, as I said, all the sites that are here. It's just all the, the shells. I was picking up shells and submitting them for radiocarbon dating. Each one of these dots represents multiple shells that were submitted, and each shell costs between $600 and $800 per date. So you're looking at a lot of money here. But if we, next slide, arrange these dates, I will explain this, don't panic. <laughs> this is 4,000 years ago. This is now, recent. And this axis here means nothing, but it is the number of the site in San Juan County. So 45 SJ1 is here, and in numerical order, the Lopez sites are here. Now, look at the Lopez sites. They're the oldest. Hey, you guys, cool. <laughs> this is um, a site on Monday. But really interesting thing is look at how many radiocarbon dates fall between 700 and 300 years BP is before present. We don't talk about the Common Era and BC and um, AD because it makes no sense here in North America. So what's going on 700 to 300 years ago? There's so many more sites. Why? I want to know why. That's what archaeologists always want to know. Why? Okay, next slide. Why are there more sites? Okay, there's like four explanations I came up with. Climate change. There is a climatic period called the Fraser Valley Fire Period. In the Fraser River Valley, um, there are people who study climate by sticking cores in wetlands and pulling the muck out. And then you sample the muck through time and you look at the pollen that is uh, uh, preserved in the muck and you count the number of pollen grains per cubic whatever and you can reconstruct the climate. And lo and behold, in the Fraser River Valley, when you get to 300 to 700, it's right around 700 and 500 years ago, there's an explosion of charcoal, wooden charcoal, like massive forest fires that continued for 100 or so years. And people are saying, what happened? These aren't archaeologists, these are paleoclimatologists. And they now realized that there was a period, at least in that part of the northwest coast, when fires were much more prevalent. Kind of reminds me of these last couple of summers we've had here. Uh, could it be that there were so many fires in the Fraser River Valley that people moved to the San Juans? It's nice out here. Okay, that's one explanation. Another explanation was, I hear you had a great talk about reef netting recently, and we don't actually know when it was invented, when it was first appeared. But if it was invented 700 years ago, that would be a really good time for people to move out here. 
because they got to get out here, they've got to process all their gear and process all the fish and, uh, that they um, catch. Uh, a third explanation is maybe because of population increase, there just were so many more people on the landscape that they moved out to the sand lines for all year long and therefore just deposited more artifacts in more depositional environments. There were just more people. And then the last one is maybe everything before 700 was eroded. Can you go back one? Maybe, maybe. So maybe there just are fewer surviving depositional environments from 4,000, 3,000, and 2,000 years ago because they've all eroded or been buried or under uh, rising sea level. Okay, so now we're going forward. Those are my four explanations. And I got 2007, 2008, I wrote a paper, I was really thrilled, I wrote to the lobby, I talked to them, this is what we found, and they look at me and they go, we don't care. <laughs> we know. We know what happened. We have traditional knowledge that tells us exactly what happened, and we're not telling you. <laughs> Why should they? Everything that they've given us, we've stolen and not given them any credit for. They know what happened in the past. Their traditions tell them what happened in the past. They have amazingly detailed stories about the Ice Age, but they're not telling the anthropologists anymore anything because all we did from Franz Boas on was take their stories, take their information, write it up in our own language, take their, their land away from them, steal their technology, and not give them any credit. So I said, I don't want to do this anymore. So, coincidentally, I also had started the directorship at the Burke Museum, where we are building a new, we were building a new museum, and we were doing consultation with tribes. And the new Burke Museum looks like this, and in the very first gallery of the Burke Museum, how many of you have been to the new Burke? Oh, that's good, okay. How many of you are going to go very soon? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Your Washington State Museum. There is a gallery, the very first gallery you walk when you walk into the building, and it says, "Culture is living. We are alive today." That is the most important message that every single indigenous group said to us. Pacific Islanders, indigenous Filipinos, uh, I knew of Japan, they all say culture is alive, we are still here, this is our culture, we know our ancestors, we know what's going on. Stop taking it from us. So we have a panel that says the violent legacy of colonialism, and I Going to um, the next slide is a blow up of this because I knew it would be very hard to read. And I wanted to read this. I can read it from here. Relationships between communities and the Burke Museum seek to preserve the and, um, ingenuity, creativity, science, and complex knowledge of these cultural resources. Community members are the experts in these areas. We are the caretakers. So addressing these patterns of cultural dominance 
means actively involving communities in every aspect of our work. And the Burke recognizes our colonial legacy, and we dedicate ourselves to learning from communities and building a more ethical and collaborative future together. If I'm going to do that, I can't do archaeology anymore. I can't do components and phases and types. I can't ask questions about why. It doesn't matter. They don't want to know. I don't want to know. Do I know? Ugh. It's now so interesting that all archaeologists at the University of Washington, the ones we train, the ones who work in cultural resource management, the ones who come to your property when you're trying to build something, you have a recorded site on your property, what they will first do is talk to the tribe and they'll say, what would you like us to do? And the tribe usually says, see if you can get the building construction to be moved off of the remaining depositional environment. And that is number one. Can you move the construction 20 feet over? Can you move it 20 feet back? And sometimes they say, and this was an example in um, South um, King County, Enumclaw area, the Snoqualmie tribe said that location in our tradition is the place where we did bear hunting. That's the name that we gave it, is where you go hunt bears. We'd be very interested if you, since you can't move the thing, if you would answer that question. That's the only question we care about. So they looked for animal remains, and sure enough, bear was the top number of fauna remains that were found at the site. And none of the other questions that we could have asked were asked because the tribe didn't care. So, <coughs> sorry, this is from Shaw Island. <laughs> I didn't have a beautiful sunset from Lopez. But that's archaeology then and now. Hey, I went 10 minutes over. It's a 50-minute hour uh, at the University of Washington. Usually I can tell when I've talked for 50 minutes. <laughs> May we ask questions? Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming you're just thinking. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go with him. He was first, then you. Well, I like quite the uh, change your in your revelation. You have many years of work in archaeology, and now you changed your approach. I'll hear a little more about how it affected you. <laughs> the question is, how does that affect me? Well, you know, as with anyone who had all the power, I'm white, I'm an archaeologist, I had a PhD, I got grant money, I had all the power, I could decide what I was going to do and what questions I was going to go at when I was going to ask, and it take it all away. And it, of course, it doesn't feel good, but yet on the other hand, it does, because it was wrong. And it, it's fun to see them, tribes, come to the Burke and begin to trust us. When we say, and, and Amy's going to do this, I think, at the Lopez Museum, bring tribal members in and say, you know, what do you, what do you think of this? What do you want us to do with this? I, how many of you have been to the new visitor center at San Juan National Park at American Camp? It just opened, was it July, August? 
It's a brand new visitor center, and the exhibits inside were done 100% with consultation of the Lummi and other tribes, I think even Canadian bands. And it is, doesn't look like you expect. It's about the environment, it's about the plants, it's about the traditions, and it's cheerful and bright and optimistic, and um, there's not one artifact. There's no points, there's no malls, there's no why questions. The tribes don't care about it. They want to talk about them and their traditions and their plants and the canvas and what is important. I strongly recommend you going over there. Um, I don't know what the hours are for the winter, but they did a beautiful job. And that makes me happy because uh, we can do better. You were next. She's going to pass. Yeah? After 300 years of war, of colonization, and then. I'm going to bring this to you so everyone. After 300 years of war, of colonization, and decimation of so many tribes, how much of the remaining knowledge is accurate and is truly valuable to the archaeologists? It's a good question, a fair question. And the answer is, I don't know. Certainly, the diseases that we brought with us, the estimates are that 90% of the population was lost. So imagine 90% of this room, well, we almost could imagine that with COVID, but we didn't get close to that number. Imagine 90% of us, and only 10% of us are left. How much information would be lost? And the, the, so certainly, some was lost. Um, especially in that a lot of their traditional um, technology was replaced with metal. So I think a lot of people who knew how to make points, stone tools, um, those people were gone. And they may not know how to make points. But I guess my answer to you is, they don't care. Right now, they don't care. Maybe someday we can partner and learn about the past together, but right now we can't do that. It, the pendulum has to swing the other way. So um, there are individuals who come up to me and say, could you tell me again how you made, you know, stone tool? How was, you know, what's a chip stone tool? What are you talking about? What do you mean a flute? What, and these are tribal members. But that's an individual who trusted me enough to ask me a question. That's not an official tribal response. Yes, sir. So assuming that, <coughs> that this trust is built over the coming years, what, what does archaeology look like 100, 200, 300 years from now? What will the focus be at that point? So assuming the trust takes uh, decades, what will archaeology look like in 200, 300 years? Um, I think the archaeology of Native American culture will never look the same. They will train their own people to be archaeologists, and they will do a different kind of archaeology. It's already happening. The Grand Ron tribe of uh, nation of Central Oregon has a uh, archaeo has trained archaeologists. They are archaeologists to peel back the sod, the grass, and excavate the square take pictures of everything that they find and put them all back and put the side back. It's affectionately called catch and release. <laughs> but that's disrespectful. But what their point is, is we want to know what's under the ground, but we don't want it to leave the ground. 
So that is now being taught in many, many places. Um, it's called the indigenous way of excavating. And it's hot right now. Now, let's be clear. It's not happening in Texas. <laughs> so this is not something that is sweeping the nation. There are hotbeds of places where if you all have a site on your private property, you can do anything you want without a permit. There's no state regulations whatsoever in the state of Texas, the whole state. So archaeology isn't changing in Texas. Uh oh. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> Did you hear that? She's from Texas, and that's why she lives on Lopez. I have a question. Uh, you haven't mentioned architecture, and it seems to me that's a big part of archaeology. So I haven't mentioned architecture, and that is a big part, part of archaeology. And that is very true, especially in the places where architectural remains are part of the archaeological record. And for example, in the southwestern United States, where you have standing Pueblo walls and you know what the, what the um, ancestral Anasazi, how they built their houses. But here in the Northwest, we have very little evidence of architecture. So, there are people who talk about where the houses were, but we don't find the houses. We don't find even where the walls were. We, if we're lucky, we'll find a very big pit with a lot of charcoal in it, and some people will say that's the center of the house. But I've never, ever seen any excavation, even when they say that there's evidence of a house there. And remember, I'm a geoarchaeologist. Half of my training is geology. And I walk up to these strata, these layers, and I said, where is it? Show it to me. Where's the edge? Where's the, you know, how they put the walls up? How do you know that? That's a what? That's a wall? Where is it? There's no wall there. And so um, architecture is very important in archaeology, but not for this part of San Juan Islands. In. Um, there's one other thing. You know, we can still study ourselves. And it's called historic archaeology. So you have a lot of homesteads on Lopez that you could apply components, types, components, phases. Um, they are accompanied by archival information, so you get very rich answers to why. The why questions, you could actually know the answers because you could do archival research plus archaeological research, and you can use glass and bottles to come up with components and phases. So I think the future, we may differentiate whose past we study. If we study our own, you know, none of these problems exist in England or Ireland or Scotland because they're all studying their own past. They think we're crazy, but they don't because they know that we have a colonial history. I mean, it came from there. They're the, you know, they started it all, but that's a completely different topic. Okay, I got here and then here. So what um, particular tribes going back the last two or three hundred years or that we should engage for here on Lopez Island that we could learn from that are in the region that would be, you know, best to understand? Okay, what tribes should we engage with to know, learn about, and talk to, and consult with, and try to gain trust? So this is going to be a complicated answer, and Amy's probably going to like, watch her face when I say that. <laughs> um, so when the United States 
was settling, colonial, colon, uh, colonizing the Western United States. The Bureau of Indian Affairs was created, and they would go across the plains, and they would say, what tribe are you? OK, you're the Lakota. Where do you use your winter village? Who is your chief? And they would negotiate the treaties with the chief. And they got here to the Northwest, and they said, OK, where is your you know, tribe? Where is your winter village? Where is your chief? And they went, what are you talking about? Like, where I don't have a village. My mother was from here. My father was from here. My uncle's from here. I spent last winter there. But I'm really from there. I and mean, look at Chief Ciel. He was a, a member of the Suquamish. He was, his father was from Seattle and Muckleshoot. And now the Duwamish are saying he's ours, but he's, you know, he was, so they got, the BIA got fed up and they said, all right, where'd you spend last winter? Okay, that's what you are, you're lonely. Where'd you spend last winter? Okay, you're Sandwich. Okay, where'd you? Okay, you're Nooksack. They literally imposed these names on people who were like, what are you talking about? So, what tribes should we engage with? You ask the tribes whether they want to engage with you. And whoever wants to engage with you, you engage with them. For purposes of repatriation, the return of human remains and sacred objects, the law told us who we had to negotiate with. And they worked it out with themselves on boundaries, you take these, you will take these. If there was a contentious issue, everybody got together and decided, okay, let's put them all in this place, we agree on this place. But I think it's really a hard question to answer. Okay, now there was, now over here, yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, 16,000 years ago was the first sign being here. How accurate do you think we are in that number? What was it that you used to substantiate that as a time? Not, did you hear that? 16,000, how accurate is that? How confident are archaeologists about that number? Not confident at all. <laughs> it changes constantly. It was, for my whole formative years, it was 12,500. 12,500. That was the closest. Well, radiocarbon dating is getting better, and we're getting more sites, and they push the dates back for Clovis to 16,000. But there are sites now, documented sites, that may be 23,000, and the, the fight that you go through when you find one of these old sites is really um, difficult because you, did you excavate it correctly? Did you have a credential? I mean, my degree is from the University of Minnesota. Is that good <laughs> enough? It's not Harvard. If I found one of these sites, I would just get just by my, my paleo Indian experts. So it is very um, contentious. Um, just went to a conference where everybody's now saying 16,000. So I literally changed my table for you guys. Uh, because, you know, it was 12,500 and then it was 14,000 and now the recent, most recent thing is 16,000. So it will change. I think, and if we are applying a logical brain, there were people in Asia and they had boats. And they came across the Pacific Ocean, and they landed in North and South America. And they probably came more than once. And they came in small groups, and they may not have survived. In these early 23,000-year-old sites, the best one is down in Chile. It's on the coast. They're definitely there. There's you know, butchering elephants, mastodons, mammoths, and they were there. But they certainly weren't very many of them and they didn't go anywhere else. So 
you know, but then along comes another one. And the ones that had Clovis points spread all over North America. So that was a truly um, successful migration across North America. Okay, I'm going to go with her, then, then you're ready. Okay. So I don't remember, several years ago, I was looking at Kiss App, and I worked with the Archive. The Brook Museum returned some plant artifacts to their new museum, and I was on the ferry from the back of the cell, and, and there were orcas surrounding the ferry. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yes. Are you kidding? You're one of the lucky ones who were on that ferry. I was not. <laughs> um, so there is a, a, it was a huge longhouse at contact with um, your, your Americans. And it's called Old Man House. And it's where Chief Seal was born and raised. And in the wise ways of horrific BIA, they burned Old Man House to the ground. And as part of that, there were archaeological excavations after the burning. And those collections, and I believe they were from the 60s, once again, building a culture history without even talking to the Suquamish, who were right around the corner, um, you know, we do this. Uh, those artifacts came to the Burke Museum, because it was a University of Washington excavation. And we had the permit. And so, um, through uh, re uh, repatriation, we had to go through, you know, we're the Washington State Museum. You own us, the Burke Museum. It's tax dollars. I can't give away uh, artifacts to anyone. It's your property. So, um, the Old Man House artifacts through, I forget what the arrangement was. You were already gone, yeah. Um, I, think we, I think we transferred ownership through the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and I don't know how exactly that was done. But um, the, they were in a van on, in the ferry, and of course, no, the people who were driving the van couldn't leave the van. You're not gonna like, leave these artifacts unattended. And it just so happened that the tribal chair, Leonard Forsman, was also on the ferry, and a reporter from either the King Five News was on the they were they were going to record the ceremony at the Suquamish Cultural Center where they welcomed the artifacts back, and a pod of orca came to the ferry and just oh, Wow. <laughs> I know. So I wasn't on the ferry, but so many people lie are lying and say they were. <laughs> <laughs> Not accusing you. <laughs> you had it. I have a question. There's a, a collaboration between an archaeologist and a native basket weaver, uh, Gail Croson and Carrier. Um, is that indicative of where things are going to be? You have, what comments do you have about that? So, um, Gail Crows is an archaeologist, and he is a good friend of Ed Carrier, who is a Squamish member. I, I think that, that that is a wonderful example of a person who has a trusted relationship with a weaver. But Dale doesn't excavate anymore. And he, so he's not a practicing archaeologist. He's given up archaeology, too. So I think it's a great example of somebody who, when you truly have a trusted relationship, through consultation, true consultation, where you actually ask someone their opinion, you listen to the answer, and you don't then ignore what they said and do exactly the opposite. <laughs> there was some back and forth with Ed learning uh, because of what the other dug up, some of the previous patterns of the, of the ancestral things. Right. Um, Dale uh, did excavate lots of baskets, and so Ed actually
actually came to the Burke Museum and used one of the baskets that came from English camp. And it was that and some others. But um, I think that's part, I mean, very much part of the trust of. I think about the friendship rather than a right. But if you think about what I said up there, we're not the experts, we're the caretakers. Ed Carrier is the expert. He asked to come and see our, the thing that we are taking care of. And we let him see anything he wants because he is the expert, not us. And it wasn't that long ago that museums would not let tribal people into the museums because they weren't PhDs, even from Minnesota. <laughs> Okay, well, I think one more question. How are we doing? You guys are speaking. Yes. So, um, some of us know Bill Hall. And we're wondering, I'm wondering how he fits into any of this. Excuse me. So, you know Bill Hall because Bill and Marty lived here on Lopez and they're the most wonderful people. Um, Bill is now passed on and Marty is still with us. Um, Bill is the reason, one of very important reasons why the Burke Museum is trusted by tribes. There was, first of all, a woman named Erna Gunther. Anybody remember? She was the director of the Burke Museum for 30 years. I don't know how she did. Um, and um, she uh, loved the botanical, ethno-botanical remains and had very friendly relationship with tribes, still very colonial though. She took their plants and the knowledge about their plants and talked about it on the radio and never, she had a radio show and a TV show, but she never asked one of the tribal members to talk on the radio. So Bill is the one who came along and said, you know, you know about we about woodworking and you know, I'd love to learn if you're willing to teach me and he listened to true consultation. And he never ever made an object of art that was a, um, a rip off, I'll say, of a Native American style. He made replicas of things that other people made. The one, the, the two totem poles at the Burke are replicas. But he's famous for putting Western culture into his paintings. So it's tribal canoe with a, you know, encounter with the early explorers. And they trusted him because he never stole anything. He only gave back to them um, and revered their expertise. Okay, I think we probably are done. I thank you so much. You are so You're allowed to only tax dollars to support this program, so we want to thank uh, San Juan County El Tax Grant and also the Lopez Island Thrift Store for supporting this program. And thank you, Julie. Weren't we lucky? Weren't we lucky?